Welcome back to the channel. We're gonna continue working on our 2002 Chevy Silverado that was rolled over. This is the one that left the factory as a red truck, but after I got my hands on it, it's now black because, well, red cars are cursed. Actually, it doesn't even matter what color it is because it's been sitting in the corner of the shop for a while and it's covered in dirt, so it's, well, dirt colored. And this would be a good time to wash the truck, but, well, that doesn't happen on this channel. So, we're just gonna continue working on it. And it did sit for a while because, well, it was all salty outside from the slush and the snow. And all that's gone now. Uh, the weather's finally broke. So now we can finish it up and take it for a test drive without it rusting away. I figure why subject it to that salt when I could just wait a month or two and it'll get another six months before it meets its final fate as a rusty Chevy Silverado. We'll start by installing our third brake light. There you go, shop turtles. I got a new gasket for it because the old one had pretty much deteriorated into nothing. We did put new bulbs on it because once it's in there, it's not coming out for a while. Now we're gonna put some fog lights in our front bumper. There's nothing left but little pieces of the bracket. We'll pull the screws out of those little pieces and set our new fog light in there. From our friends in China. Open in and toss the extra pieces in the garbage. Well, he's been here before. And we'll cut the zip ties off that are holding the lower balance on. And we'll clip the little clips in that are supposed to be in there instead of zip ties. It's got some GM truck emporium had a few laying around. Snap them all in there. Once the balance is all clipped in the way it's supposed to be, we'll pull the rest of our bracket off for our fog light and set our new fog light in there. Bolt that in. And we missed one clip. Snap it in. And the tabs for the upper pad are broken off that are supposed to hold this onto the bumper. So we're gonna put a couple screws in it. Put a pair of vice grips on it to hold it where we want it. And we're just gonna run some self-tapping screws in the back edge. This will be inside the wheel opening. Clamp off of there and screw it down. Good as new. Actually better, it won't come off. Do the same thing on the other side and I'll get to be the somebody that's been here before. And tighten it down and that's the little clip that's supposed to be holding that piece on. We no longer need it, so we'll tear it off and throw it in the garbage. The supervisor has informed me that I need to change this tow hook because it's broken. So we're going to do that. And she's going to watch and make sure I adhere to strict safety standards like I usually do. Wow. And our frame gets sucked in a little bit when you tighten up that bolt. So we're going to hammer it out so we can slide our new tow hook in here. A little tap 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 a -roo. and we'll start the bolt that goes through it and the bolt in the bottom. Now we can tighten everything down to factory specifications for electric ugga duggas. Now that the supervisor finally got out of the way we can get some work done. We got our tow hooks on, our bumpers assembled, so now we can throw the bumper on the truck. Just set it up on the bumper brackets in the center and slide it in. run our bolts down in there. Now we can install our parking lights. We'll put all new bulbs in here too. Put in the inside edge and then snap the outside in. We can plug in our headlights. Slide those into the bracket and put our pins in there. Now we can throw our grill up there. There's clips in the edges of the fenders. And there's a couple twist in locks, one in each corner. Just turn them 90 degrees and they lock in. They have Phillips heads on them. And we'll clip in the other side. 
and there's one bolt in the center. We'll throw our closeout panel up on the top and put all our little push pins in it. Now we can bolt the bumper brackets on the outer edges of our bumper, get it all lined up so it's got an even gap. There is some adjustment in there. We'll put the little panels on the edge of our cowl panel, cover up the hood hinges, and on this side, we got an antenna that sticks through it. So we'll bolt that in. Click. This one just clips right in. Now for the most satisfying part of this build, peeling the plastic off of our brand new fog lights. I opted for the smoked ones. Now we need to change our leaky water pump. So we're gonna have to pull off our air box here and our air intake tube. Pull the upper radiator hose out of the fan shroud. And we're gonna go back and put our marker lights in because I got distracted. This truck's not picky. You can put the marker lights in before or after the grill. Headlight in, put our pins in. All headlights should be that easy. Back to our water pump. We're gonna separate our fan shroud. We're just gonna take the top half off. We'll leave the bottom half in there. There are some push pins that hold the two pieces together and a couple screws that hold the top piece into the radiator support. I'll pull this shroud out of here. Spring clamps, yay. Slide the clamp up so we can get our radiator hose off. Like it on there. And we'll unclip this water line. Put our hose off to the side. Now we're gonna spin the fan off. Hit it with our fan tool. Those are available on my Amazon store. Make this job so much easier. Once it's broken loose, it just spins right off. I usually do it when the belt is still on. It makes it a little easier. So you're not chasing it around. And now we can take the belt off. Get some tension off of it. Just pull it off the pulleys. We'll toss it off to the side and forget the routing. We can unbolt our tensioner. Now we can pull off the lower radiator hose and our two heater hoses because I love spring clamps so much. And these are the great kinds with the locks in them that hold it open just long enough to snap on your fingers. Slide them all back. And we're probably going to have to peel those hoses off the water pump. And then we'll just let the antifreeze leak on the floor so that the supervisor has something to drink. Relax, PETA. I'm not going to let her drink antifreeze. There's plenty of battery acid available if she's thirsty. Now that everything's off of our water pump, we can go ahead and unbolt it from the block. There's just six bolts that hold it in. And now we can pull the whole thing out of here. We just left the thermostat in it. You can buy them with the thermostat separate, but I bought the one that came with the thermostat and housing. It is a 200,000 mile thermostat, so it's probably due for one. There's our new water pump. Toss the directions in the pile where they belong. And then we'll put our gaskets on. You put the bolts through the gaskets. They're held in place so you don't have to try to squeeze them back there when you're holding up the water pump. The holes in the gaskets are just slightly smaller than the bolts, so it holds them in. And 
and now we're ready to go send it in the truck. Well, first we got to do a little housekeeping. We already cleaned off all the old gasket material. We're just wiping off what little stuff is left. And now we can set the water pump in there. Start a couple bolts by hand. And then we can run them in. Once we have them all started, we can torque them down to manufacturer specs. And now we're ready to put our hoses back on. Move our spring clamps back. See if we can get them not to catch on the locks. And that one caught, so we had to release it from the lock. Now we gotta set the spring clamp timing. Make sure it's right back where it was before. And then we can bolt our tensioner back onto our water pump. And now we can drop our belt in here loop it around the crankshaft and then around our water pump, power steering pump, alternator, tensioner, and slip it underneath the idler. Make sure the belt's on, all the pulleys. We'll pull our little protector off the threads on the water pump and we can spin our fan back on. Get really mess with the safety experts and start this thing up and drop the fan in there and let it put itself on. But we don't need to give them a heart attack today, so we'll just put it on the safe way, the boring way, the slow way. Once we spun it all the way on there, we can put our fan clutch tool in there, give it a little bump, tighten it up, and our fan's installed. We can drop our fan shroud back in here. Complete with original dirt. Got our clips and the fan shroud to hold it together. And we'll bolt in the top of it. And put our upper radiator hose on. Flip it into the shroud. And move our spring clamp down. Now we can clip our hoses back together so they aren't falling down in the belt or something. We'll install our brand new air filter. The other one was an oil bath air filter from when it was upside down. Drop the cover on and screw it down. Plug in our mass airflow sensor and put our air tube back in here. Got to make sure that the bottom of that boot doesn't get folded under. Makes it all the way around the throttle body. And then push it on. Push it on the other side on the mass airflow sensor and tighten it all down. Now we're gonna head to the complete opposite end of the truck and put our tailgate all back together. We had it apart so that they could edge it all out. I'm just gonna put the latches back in and the cables. Gotta make sure that the rod ends up where the handle's gonna be. There's a metal divider inside the tailgate. It likes to go on the bottom and then you have to take it back out and do it again. Now we can drop our handle in there. And we'll start one of the bolts, hold it in place. And then we can connect our rods, come from our latches. Push them into the clips and then 
Put the clip over the rod. And now we can bolt our handle in. We didn't edge out the middle of it because we're going to put the bed liner in there. We'll throw our tailgate on just to get it out of our way. We'll probably take it back off to do the bed liner, but we also have to do the bed liner on the tops of the bed rails. The stuff that's actually in the bottom of the bed is still good. And now we're going to clean some of the dirt out of the bottom of our truck. It's still red down here. I mean, it's cursed. This truck's probably going to weigh about 50 pounds less after I get all this dirt out of here. This is just part of what I had to take out of it. Pulled it out of the frame rails, out of the rockers. This thing must have spent more time off-road than on-road. This is after I had already run some water through it. So now that all our dirt is out of there, we can put our cavity wax in these rockers. So that years from now, it'll be the only Silverado with rockers. It won't stop the rust 100%, but it definitely slows it down. And I have the video to prove it. The good thing about working on older vehicles is that you get to see where the rust spots are so you can make sure that you're spending your time wisely. And it is a Chevy, so the rust spots are pretty much anything metal. And no, I'm not hating on Chevy. It's just the truth. Make sure we get on both sides of the panels inside the rocker. They're pretty clean now. I want them to stay that way. We'll put our caps back in. Let's pop those out so that we could get the wand up there. And we'll go over and do the other side. Another bad spot for rust on these is over the wheel arches, so we get up there and get our wax in there. And the reason for that is there's a panel in there, and in between the two panels there's about a quarter inch of space, and dirt likes to collect up there, and salt, and it just rots it out from the inside. There's actually three plugs in there that you can pop out and get the wand up there and clean it out. And nobody ever does that. If you live down south, you don't have to worry about this. But we do up here. Now we're going to take care of our fenders that also rust over the wheel arches. And the front edge of the hood, which is another common spot. These are all places where dirt and salt collect and then sit behind the panels and then rot them out from the inside. So now they'll be sitting on wax. They'll last a lot longer. We'll even do the sides. So we're going to need to get our dashboard back in this thing. We'll have to change out the radio because I think the other one went bad with all that water that was dripping on it when the windshield was out of it. Uh, we got to put a wheel stud on the back and then we're going to take it for a ride and see what other mechanical work we need to do before this thing is ready to hit the road. Oh my God, I don't know how they found me, but they found me. Run for it, Spotty. Who do you think? The clean freaks. So you promise if I just read the cards, you're gonna let Spotty go. All right. I love cleaning. It has become my favorite part of all the rebuilds. I wish I could do nothing but clean cars. I don't even wanna fix them anymore. 
So since I have now joined this cleaning cult, I figure we might as well make it as easy on ourselves as possible. So picked up this little power washer. It's an electric unit. Uh, comes with four different tips. Uh, the sprayer handle, the little foamy soapy thingy, and a little brush. I haven't used the brush yet. I've actually used this. Uh, it works great for like our spray masking stuff. Uh, it used to have to like hose it down and then let it dissolve and then spray it off with a hose as best you could and then wipe it down. This thing, you just wet it and then blow it right off. Makes, cuts it in about half the time of getting all that overspray mask off the car. Uh, we're gonna see how it does on this thing, uh, getting all the dirt off the outside and maybe even clean the engine. Of course, there are some hieroglyphics on here that say not to clean an engine, but uh, well, I don't follow directions, so we're gonna clean the engine. That's probably just for Fords because, well, you know, you look at them wrong and the coils go bad. Definitely can't put water on them. Setup of this guy is pretty easy. Screw our hose into the back. Turn the hose on. Plug it in. Flip the switch and start washing. It's on demand, so you let go of the trigger and it stops running. Switch to our little soap nozzle. And rinse it all off. Actually makes washing cars a little bit more enjoyable. I don't know if it's enough that you're gonna see me washing everything on the channel every time, but maybe I'll wash more stuff. And there's our dirty engine. Let's see if we can clean it up a little bit. I changed the tip from the 40 degree down to the 15 degree so I can get in the tight spots to really put this thing into the test because this thing was full of mud when I got it and the engine still is. I put it together dirty because that's what I normally do. I did have that one guy that commented on YouTube that if I would have cleaned all the parts before I put it together, I could have gotten another thousand bucks for this car or truck. Um, so instead I'm gonna clean it after I put it together and I'm only gonna raise the price by 500 bucks. And if you were gonna buy this car and it's now $500 more expensive, you can go thank that guy. So let's see how good this does. Fun fact, that particular hater had nothing but negative things to say for months on pretty much every single video I posted. Uh, until he got the attention that he so desired from me in my usual style. Haven't heard from him since. Turns out those haters can dish it out, but they can't take it. I got a new hood light repair tool. Let's see how it works. So we got it all washed up just to get all that dirt off of it. Uh, it's nice and clean now, but we're still gonna give it to the detailing gnome. He's gonna polish it all and clean it really good. Uh, that was just a quick wash, but let's see if it starts since we broke the rules of the hieroglyphs. Was there ever really even a question? Of course it starts. It's not a Ford. So if you've recently joined a cleaning cult or you're already in one and just wanna make your life a little bit easier, you can go ahead and pick one of these little guys up. There's a link in the description and it'll actually give you a discount. Uh, comes with all this stuff and it does a pretty good job. I've been using it for a while and I really have no complaints. It's pretty compact and everything stores here. I wish there was a place for this stuff, but it could go on a shelf close to our little power washer here. Great for home use for cleaning off your cars. And if I'm endorsing a cleaning product, you know it must be useful. So uh, if you are buying it to wash your pets or children, uh, that's not allowed. Although if the supervisor writes me up one more time, I'm gonna let you know on the whole pet thing. Had I not wanted to play with my new toy, I probably wouldn't have washed the thing up. And if you're wondering why, we'll take a look at the hood because after spending, well, I don't know, about three minutes in the shop, it's full of dust again. Most of which came from sanding everything down so we could put the bed liner on. I've avoided this part long enough. It's time to throw the dash back together. We put the top of the dash back on, slides into tabs up in the front. Don't forget to screw the daylight sensor in there. And once it clips in, we put our grab handle in there. And start putting all of our screws in there. Pretty sure I left them in the glove box. There's a couple Phillips behind these vents. Snap 
Put the vents back in there. And a couple more Phillips on the sides. Our cover on the side. A couple more Phillips on this side. And the rest of them are just regular bolt heads. We can put our A pillar trim back in. Slide it into the top of the dash. And with the clip at the top and hammer it on with your A pillar trim installation tool or your bumper installation tool. Hardest part is getting that top clip lined up. And not breaking it. Now that the interior work is done, we can rebuild this thing mechanically. We have a wheel hub that's pretty wobbly, and I'm pretty sure it's making noise. Either way, it's got to come apart. And uh, drive axle that's slinging grease all over the place. So in order to get to those, let's pull our brake caliper off of here. And we're probably going to have to put brakes on it. Because there's quite a ridge in the outside of that rotor. Push the caliper in. And set it up on the control arm. You see the grease all over everything from the drive axle. And it's due for pads. We're going to have to go order those. Take our bracket off for the caliper. Spin the bolt out by hand. It's unheard of around me. Take the rotor off of here. We can disconnect the ABS wire. Comes with our new hub, so the sensors are separate. They can be replaced, but they come with the hubs. So the drive axle nut off of it. And get the washer out of there. Look at that, not frozen into the hub. We can unbolt our drive axle from the differential. Rotate it, get to the next one. And then pop it off of there. slide it past, but we don't have enough room in there. So we're going to have to drop the skid plate, and now we should have enough room to slide it out of there. But we're hitting our sway bar length. Now we're going to do something else that's also unheard of by me, and that's unbolt our sway bar link and be able to reuse it. Slide the drive axle out of here, toss that in a pile, and we can unbolt our wheel hub. Tap the hub out of the knuckle. And we can put our new one in there, make sure we get the backing plate in the right place. our bolts in and run our ABS wire back up to on top of the control arm. Put a little grease inside of our hub before we slide the drive axle in to make life easy on the next guy. I'll throw that out on the drive axle so it doesn't walk itself back out of there. 
and then we'll reconnect it to our front diff. We'll start all our bolts. Just rotate it around to get them all started. And now we can tighten them all down. Now we can throw our high performance brake rotors on, cross drilled and slotted, adds 20 horsepower per wheel. Tighten up our drive axle nut, tighten up our caliper bracket, and we can bolt our old sway bar link back in here. What kind of witchcraft is this? Now we're going to change our shocks. These are a little tired. We put a pair of rice grips on the top of it so it doesn't turn. And then we can get the nut off the top. Slowly. And try to get our tools back out of here. Pull the washer and the bushing off the top. And we can unbolt the bottom. Now to compress it a little bit. Sneak it out of here. Not the worst I've seen. Also not the best. And it's dirty. And we know I don't like to put dirty parts on. So compress our new one and quickly put it in there. Put our bushing and washer back up on the top and bolt in the bottom. Tighten it all down. Turn the bottom bolt. And we're done. I did learn from previous struggles, it's a little easier to get that nut started on the top of the shock if the suspension isn't totally unloaded. So I just jammed a wrench under that upper control arm, so that'll hold it up about half an inch, whatever the width of that wrench is, and give us a couple threads on the top of that shock. Sometimes you don't have enough and you try to run it up there, you end up pulling the threads off the shock. So this gives us two threads, we should be good. Toss that shock in a pile and stick our new one in here. Put our bolt through the bottom. Compress it. And get it back through the frame. Now we can put our bushing and washer on the top. And we can tighten the nut down and Draw the shock up in there and watch our wrench fall on the ground. I mean, control arm spacer. Tighten up the bolt on the bottom. Now we're going to head to the back. we got to change that wheel stud. We're going to pull our caliper bracket off of here. And the electric ratchet wants to stay in the truck. Sorry, you gotta go, buddy. Pull the bolt the rest of the way out of there. And compress our caliper a little bit. Not enough. It's stuck on the ridge at the end of that rotor. Since it still has the original lock washers on the brake rotor, you might be in for a surprise when we get this thing off. Just grab one of the little tabs and Bend it up, they usually break in half, and you slide the drum slash rotor off of there. We'll hammer out the wheel stud, and there's our surprise. Got these new style parking brake shoes that don't have any material on them. Metal to metal contact makes it hold better. We can run our new stud in here. Put the bearing on the outside, so you just tighten it up, bearing will spin and draw it in there. Get it 
all the way in and spin our lug nut off, get our bearing out. And now we can change our shocks in the back while we wait for our brakes to show up. Bolt the bottom on each side. And get hit in the head with the rear end. And we can unbolt the dots. And toss those in a pile. Slide our new ones up there. Start our bolts in the top. And we'll tighten it down. Make sure we get the bottom where it goes. We don't want too much stress on that bushing. And then tighten it down. Click. I'll pull the shock off the other side. Getting a bit of a dirt shower with this thing. Wiggle the shock out of there. And we can put our new one up there. Nice and clean. Must mean it's better. Tighten up the upper bolt. And we put a stand underneath the rear end so we get the bottom bolt started. And we'll get the side in a couple threads. It doesn't want to go in there. But it's about to. Let's run it in. And we can put our nut on it. And tighten it all down. stand out of here and our parking brake shoes showed up There's a little bracket that holds them in comes with the parking brake shoe we'll unbolt that and just slide it up or down and then over the axle they don't always fit that way. These are nice. Some you have to take the axle out. This isn't one of them. It's a tight fit, but it will go in there. Look at these fancy new parking brake shoes with the lining. Got it where it belongs. Put our little clip in there to hold it in. I used to have little fingers for this. Then we'll tighten it down. Slap our new brake rotor on there. That's 40 more horsepower now we've added. And bolt our bracket in. Slide our pads in. Drop our caliper on. Now we're going to do all the same thing on the other side with the exception of taking the wheel stud off. Only a little bit faster on this side.
missing parts. We still had about two more stops left in those brake pads. I don't know why I changed them. And the part that was missing were the brake pad shims. So they were kind of just flopping around in there. Pull our rotor off of here. And slide our brake shoes on. They wanted to come with the rotor. So find just the right way to get them off. We'll slide our new ones on. And bolt them down. We'll put our new rotor on. That's 60 horsepower. Put our bracket back up there. Bolt it in. Put our pads up. And then drop our caliper on. Our old set of tires were pretty much slicks. Might have had something to do with why it ended up on its roof. So we got a brand new set, so I'm gonna throw those on and then we'll get them on the truck. I figured I'd share the tire mounting that you missed, if for no other reason, just to really annoy the safety experts. Safety first. If you can't get your beads to seat, get some magic tire mounter in a can. So we didn't get to use our brake job hammer in the left front because we had to change the hub and the axle. And we couldn't use it on the rear because I forgot the attachment that also does the parking brake shoes. So I guess we'll just use it on the only wheel we can. So much easier than the old fashioned way. In addition to being all wobbly, it was pretty noisy. So I think we found the bad one. There's some pretty good ridges in these rotors. I would say they're probably original. 200,000 miles, and probably just kept throwing pads on them. At least up here, our rotors rust out so bad, we have to change them. We have our brand new Lee Market brand speaker installed. Uh, don't knock it, because it's still better than the factory. So now we can throw our car back together. We already waxed it a long time ago. We'll plug the light back into the door panel and the smaller speaker. We'll line up the tabs on the back of the door panel and push it down. Best door panels ever. We'll snap our trim in behind the door handle and put our screws underneath the pull handle and a little triangle piece in the corner. Our door lock back in there. One more screw in the front of the handle. Plug in our switches and smash them on there. And our door's back together. So I got a new seven pin connector to replace our old one here that the cover broke off of and it's full of dirt and it's green and it's crusty. Uh, it comes with this bracket so that we can mount it right here next to the old one because it was such a good spot for it that, you know, We'll make sure it gets destroyed just like the old one did. Um, so instead of putting it down there, we're gonna take this bracket and we're going to use it as a template to mark right here. Where we're going to put this, where it's a little bit more protected, like GM should have done and eventually did maybe after they watched one of my other videos where I did this. 
So after you've used this as a template to mark that, you can toss that in the pile and we can just unplug this. This is pretty much plug and play. I sprung for the one that had the plug on the back of it. They do have ones you can just cut the wires and splice them in, but I'm too lazy for that. So this is supposed to come apart if it didn't have 20 years of dirt in it. All right, anyway, let's drill our hole. We'll worry about that later. So we got a hole saw here. Yes, it's in Milwaukee. All the Milwaukee fans just jizzed in their pants. So I think this is the right size anyway. Yeah. Close enough. I didn't even hit the harness. All right, let's play this game again. This time with weapons. Or green crusty free now. I cleaned it up a little bit. Okay. Clean the terminals. Probably clean the dirt out of it. Down there. And make sure you clean up your mess or that'll all rust up there. Done. Gotta go find a trailer. Now well, since our bed liner's done on our tailgate, we can finish putting it back together. We'll put our little spoiler on here. Some of them just have a cover that goes over the top. The fancy ones had a spoiler. This particular truck had neither, but since it had the nut certs in there for the spoiler, I assume Click. at one time it had a spoiler. Luckily, Scott's GM Truck Emporium had one in stock. So we just screwed that in there. There was some two-sided tape on the back. I did pull a little piece of it off so I could grab the backing. You don't want to just pull the backing off of there because it tends to want to stick where it doesn't belong. So you bolt the other side in, push it in, and then stick it down. 
gives it a nice tight fit. Don't break the backing. We got to start over. Let's work our way across. Sea turtle food. And when the tabs inevitably break off the back, a little windshield urethane. Perfect. So the truck is clean enough to take it out on the road and be seen in public. So I'm gonna go take it for a little ride and see if we can set the monitors, see if we get any check engine lights. I'd be willing to bet we're going to get one. And no, it's not for an EVAP leak like everybody thinks it might be. Uh, these older ones, known for knock sensors. So that'd be my bet as to why the light will come on if it comes on. So I'm gonna go take a drive and see if I was right. And I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Let's give it a shot. Probably should have clipped it all the way in.